Thank you, Brother Joy. Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful winter day, isn't it? I like this spring weather in the winter. My favorite kind of weather. So good to be with you this morning. I am interested in your attitude. Check your attitude. What's your attitude like this morning? Wherever you have been and what you have done do not matter nearly as much as does your attitude. Because if you and I have the right attitude, then we can make progress. But if your attitude is poor, though we both may be close to the kingdom of God, with a poor attitude, we have some trouble. So your attitude is very important. Now, today's text is Matthew chapter 5. So you want to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. This text is what we often call the beginning of the chapter is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. It's what we love to refer to as the Beatitudes. But look at that word, the Beatitudes. These are attitudes that must be. There is a command in that word, Beatitude. And what follows is a list of attitudes to be. Now, I'm not into philosophy today. I'm not a philosopher. I'm a gospel preacher. But I am into life. And attitudes deal with life. Attitudes have to do with life. So the Lord is saying here at the very beginning of the greatest sermon ever heard, the Lord is saying, make this your attitude. Make this your lifestyle. Let this be how you approach life. And these Beatitudes are really a picture of Jesus Christ. You know, I sometimes don't practice what I preach. I try, but like you, I, I sometimes fail to do what I know I should be doing and even what I preach that we all should be doing. I sometimes fall short of God's mark for my life and, and, and the way I should be. But Jesus never did. He never failed to practice what he preached. And so this, the greatest sermon ever heard, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, or a picture of the life of Jesus Christ. You know, we have several synopses in the New Testament, uh, brief statements of the life of Christ where the Lord's life is summed up in just a few words. His youth is summed up by Luke in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. He uh, uh, grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Peter simply said, when he was at the house of Cornelius, Peter simply summed up the life of Christ in these few words in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, saying he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. Now here in the Beatitudes, we have a few more verses in which the life of Christ is summed up. So whenever you become the man or the woman depicted in the Beatitudes, then you also become a reflection of the life of Jesus Christ. People can see Jesus in you whenever you are following these Beatitudes. So if you want a checklist of uh, uh, a checklist that you may use to see how you're doing, see how you measure up to the example of Jesus Christ, then just look at the Beatitudes at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5. Now, I do not doubt that you've heard many, many sermons uh, on uh, coming from the Beatitudes. It, it, there's a seven-point sermon outline. It's easy to preach. I know Joey's preached it many times because it's so easy to preach. And you've heard him preach on the Beatitudes. So you've heard it before. You know them well. But I'm going to do something a little bit different today. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to apply these blessed attitudes to our marriages. I'm going to apply the blessed attitudes of the Lord's sermon to our homes, our families, our marriages. How does one build a home? Now that's something we've been talking about over the weekend. We continue to discuss it today. We're spending a lot of time on it. We should. It's important. 
How do you build a home? Well, you do it by building people because people are in a marriage. You cannot take two bad people and have a good marriage. It just doesn't work. You can't do that. You cannot take two miserable, unhappy people and hitch them together and then magically have a happy marriage. What you do is you take two great, happy, Christian people and put them together and unite them and they together build a majestic home, the best possible home. It takes people. And so I'm in the people building business. That's what I hope to do. That's my goal. That's my aim. That's what I want to do is build people, Christian people. More than 30 years ago, I read that by the year 2000, marriage would be extinct. I actually read that by some person who's supposed to know such things. I'm glad to see it didn't happen. I'm so thankful it didn't happen. And I'm glad to see that today people are still interested in marriage as we should be. And we should be interested in the marriage that God created, the home that God established. People continue to be interested in marriage today. We've seen that interest here over the weekend. And again today, we've seen the interest in this great subject that we're studying from God's Word. And one reason that people are still interested in marriage today is because there's nothing better than a good home, a good family, and good marriage. There's just nothing better than that. Ask anyone who is accountable and he will tell you, I would give anything for a good home life, for a good family, for a good marriage. And God has blessed us. MJ and I just so often thank God that we've been so blessed with four good children who have good families and it really wasn't that hard. Together we were on the same page and rearing our children always. And uh, they were, I think, easy to raise. We were blessed and we we're thankful for that because there's just nothing better than a good home and a good family. And it starts with marriage. And so people are interested in improving their marriages. Wanting to help on that. I preach a lot on home and family and marriages and uh, courtship and um, because I think it's so important and because I want to be helpful uh, to people having good lives, I preach a lot on it. And it's needful today. So the way to build a, the way to build a church, the way to build this congregation of the Lord's people is to build homes, build families, build marriages. Because congregations are made up of people. Homes are made up of people. So if you build up the people, strengthen the people, then you build up the church, build up the home as well, and then the home builds up the church. So the church is no stronger than the homes from which the members of the church come. A church is made up of individuals, and those individuals come from homes. So I'm working on your home, and I'm working on your family to build up this church. That's the way it works because people want to improve their homes. Now, based on the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount, here are some seven things. Now listen to this. Here are seven things that we need to learn to say in our families. We've been talking about some things that we need to do. We're talking about attitudes this morning. And here from your attitude are seven things that we need to learn to say in our marriages under the caption, the blessed attitudes of marriage. You have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter five. All right, let's start down there at verse three. The first thing we need to learn to say in our marriages is I was wrong. I was wrong. Here's what the Lord said in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. 
What do you think of yourself? What do you think about yourself? You see, when, when men and women think too highly of themselves, when they are full of themselves, when they're self-satisfied, when they're self-sufficient, they cannot be called poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are, are bankrupt. They are totally abandoned in, in spirit. Now, this is not the feeling of self-pity. The Lord did not say, blessed is the man who says, oh, woe is me. That's not the attitude. The Lord was not promoting uh, a bad self-esteem, poor self-esteem. He does not commend that. The noun that the, that the Lord used, poor in spirit, means a beggar. He was referring to a beggar. Blessed is the man who is a beggar. Blessed is the one who is a beggar. Well, how does that apply to marriage? How does that apply to our being able to say in our families, I was wrong? Well, it means I can say that. Can you say that? You know, some people cannot say. They have trouble saying, I was wrong. There's some things we have trouble saying. You know, I went, listen, I, I was born and reared in the great state of Tennessee. I'm a graduate of the University of Tennessee. My blood is orange. I'm a Tennessee fan. I've had a rough weekend. I slept the past two nights under the oversight of Bear Bryant. I mean, really, literally. I'm serious. There is a, a head thing of Bear Bryant overlooking the bed where I slept. It was a fitful sleep, restless nights. And I, you know, Tennessee did poorly the last few years in football. So I went to the, the championship game with, listen, the Salem Church where I preach is full of Alabama fans. It just, it's full. But we're close enough to the state of Tennessee. We've got three or four families who drive across the border and they worship with us and they wear orange. They wear orange all the time. And so it's tolerable. But I went to the, I went to the uh, uh, championship game with the Alabama fans, the place was full. It was packed. And so they were all saying, Andy, come on, say it, say it. And so I tried. I said, I said, I can't say it. I can't say it. There are some things that we just can't say. And some people have trouble saying, I was wrong. I made a mistake. I messed up. But for the good of our homes, our families, our marriages, we have to be poor enough in spirit, bankrupt enough of ourselves to be able to say when we mess up, I was wrong. And the one who has emptied himself of pride, who is bankrupt of pride, can say that. And so we've got to be able to say to our spouse, honey, I was wrong. Now, didn't I just fix all the marriages in Parish, Alabama? You know, it, it just fixed all the problems. With, and that must be right because this is Jesus speaking. This is our Lord and Master speaking. And he's giving the Magna Carta of Christianity. He says that we will always have problems at home as long as pride is dominant. So Jesus is teaching us, you must pour yourself out to build a marriage. I want to say to our, to our young people here today, before you marry, find someone who will love God more than he or she loves you. But, but you're saying, but I just found, I just found the girl I love more than anything. That's not going to work. You've got to love God more than you love each other. I am so thankful Truly, I mean this. God has blessed me with a woman now for more than 50 years that loves God more than she loves me. See, she thinks that I'm wrong sometimes. And she knows God is never wrong. And so she might have to mention that to me sometime. You know, Andy, this is, uh, this is just not good. This is just not right. And so she's helpful to me in that. And I have to say, you know, you're right, honey. I was wrong. So the first thing the Lord suggests to us 
concerning our attitude that will help us in our marriages is to be able to say, I was wrong. Number two, we need to be able to say, please forgive me. Look at verse four where Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. You have to have heart in marriage. It's not a business. It's not a transaction. It requires heart. Now, I know we sign papers and we make vows and promises and we have a contractual agreement. You have to sign the paper. The wife has to sign the paper. You have to, uh, the preacher has to sign the paper. You have to send it to the judge and it has to be registered. It looks like a business, but it isn't. You have to have heart in the marriage. Many couples would not divorce for anything. They think it's wrong. They wouldn't dare divorce, but they are emotionally divorced while they're living in the same house. It's not enough just not to divorce because God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be happy at home. He wants you to be happy in your marriage. He wants you to be happy in, in your family. He wants you to have a happy home. The same God who said, blessed are those who mourn is the God who said, a merry heart is like good medicine in Psalm, or rather Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 22. And that same God caused Paul to write, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice in Philippians chapter four and verse four. And Jesus very often said, be of good cheer. The Lord wants you to be happy. Be happy. That's a theme of God's word, the Bible. Be happy. So it can never be said that there's something good about mourning in and of itself. Just to be sorry, just be sorry enough for what you have done to be able to say to your spouse, I was wrong. Please forgive me. You know, there will be times that husbands and wives will have to cry together. There will be mistakes made. I don't care where you are in your marriage or if you're dating. Uh, there will be mistakes made by both of you. And there will be times for you to cry together. Do it. Just cry together. Ask for forgiveness. Be able to say that. You know, what can break the ice and remove the tension better than a, a big old strong man coming to his wife tenderly and saying, please forgive me. You can't unlove a guy like that. I mean, you can't dislike a guy like that. You, you, know, you, 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 you have to love him. And so Jesus would say, spouses need to forgive each other. Every day, my wife shows me charity. She, she puts up with a lot of things I do that I know bother her. But she puts up with them anyway. And sometimes, a lot of times, it's just kind of understood because we know each other that well that I'm bothering her and I need to say, please forgive me. All right, number three. The third thing is we look at the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. We need to be able to come to say in our homes, our families, and our marriages, let us do what is best for you. The Lord said in verse five, blessed are the meek. In marital counseling, it's usually uh, the man who is silent and, uh, and the, the husband is silent and the woman is, is a nagger. I mean, that's what I usually get in, in marriage counseling. You know, it, she talks too much. She, talks, she nags me all the time. And you know what the wife says? He never says anything. He sits and watches football all fall. He watches so much football, he turns into a zombie. And you know, anybody who would watch golf has to be a zombie to start with, right? Well, I must be one of those zombies because I... But I talk to my wife when I'm watching golf. I say, did you see that putt? That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, I saw it, yeah, yeah. So the woman says, he won't talk to me. And the man says, she nags me to death. So, but the Lord said, 
Let's do what's best. He said, blessed are the meek. Now, what does that mean? Blessed are the meek. How does that work in our marriage? Well, the word that Jesus used refers to a gentle lowliness. Uh, he referred to taking a, a powerful animal and harnessing, bridling that animal and that strength and bringing it under control for great benefit. That's the terminology he used. Controlling, controlling strength for great benefit. That's meekness. And that's what we have to learn to do, especially us men. We need to be able to bridle that strength and that energy and that, that uh, temperament and, and bring it under control for benefit to the marriage and to the family. And so in the marriage, we are saying, learn to say, let's do what is best for you. At a big seminar, men were telling what they did, what work they did. One man said, well, I'm a CPA. And another said, I'm a doctor. And then this good old boy stood up and he gave his name and he said, my job is to make my boss look good. And they laughed at him. But what do you think about that? He'll probably be employed longer than anybody because his job is to make his boss look good. Now think about how that works in the, in the family, in the marriage. In the marriage, your job is to make your spouse look good. That's your job. And, you know, wouldn't that, how's that work in the church? Wouldn't that be great if we emphasize that and we work toward that in the church? You know, if uh, it's the preacher's job to make the elders look good and the elder's job to make the deacons look good and the deacon's job to make the members look good and the member's job to make the preacher look good. I'm going to tell you, that's a happy church right there. That's a thriving, living, working, energetic, happy church. Everybody wants to be a member of that congregation, be a member of the, the Lord's body and work with a congregation like that. If you are miserable, if you're a miserable, unhappy person and you think I need to get married because that'll, that'll help my life and make my life better. No. Nope. If you're an unhappy person and you get married, you're going to be an unhappy married person. And we're, all, we're as happy as we plan to be. We're only as happy as we plan to be. And I, I decided a long time ago, because preaching has so many challenges, so many ups and downs, and, and, and preachers have so many people's problems, and they're trying to help, and there's so many challenges in preaching. But I said to myself a long time ago, and to my wife, I said, look, I'm just going to be happy. I don't care what happens. I don't care who's messed up and how much they try to mess me up. I'm still going to be happy. You're just as happy as you decide to be. So an unhappy person gets married is going to be an unhappy married person because there's just no magic in marriage. Marriage is not magic. Marriage is hard work. Now, you who are married, you know that, don't you? Marriage is hard work. Somebody said that marriage is like twirling a baton, turning handsprings, and eating with chopsticks. It looks easy until you try it. That's marriage. It's hard work. Marriage is not the solution to life's problems. But then somebody says, but I have needs and I have wants. Well, the paradox in life is the more a spouse serves the other spouse, the more the spouse is helpful to the other in the marriage bond, then the happier he or she is. That's the way it really works. That's a paradox. It sounds wrong, but it's right. Strength under control for the benefit. That's meekness. Then the Lord said that we need to be able to say in our marriages, let us do what is right. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger for doing right. What's he saying? As a married couple, we must agree together always to do what's right. We will not circumvent, promote, 
cover up and perfume anything because it will not work. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Be right. Determine what is right and do it. That's the only way to live. Husbands and wives together must have a spiritual appetite. Together, we have got to want to know what God's will is because that's what we want to do. That's what we're going to do. When we started having children, we started having nighttime devotionals. You know, I, I recommend that. As a family, have nighttime devotionals. It won't take long. 15, 20, 30 minutes. Sing a few songs. Teach your children how to sing. Read from the Bible a little bit. Pray together. It won't take long. Do it when it's convenient for the whole family. It might be early in the morning is the best time. Ours was at nighttime right at bedtime. You know, kind of calm them down a little bit before we put them to bed. We kept that as long as we had children in the home. We did that. Now they do that with their children. And it's instilling in them the idea, well, we need to always remember there is a God and we need to know what God wants us to do for our good. You know, that's what Moses told Israel when he was giving them the law that God gave to him at Mount Sinai. He said, this is for your good. You keep these statutes and commandments and ordinances. It's for your good that you do that. And then we need to be able to say to each other in our marriages, I forgive you. The Lord said, blessed are the merciful in verse 7 of our text. You know, he once told the Pharisees, you need to learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. We need to learn that too. We need to learn mercy. But you can't learn mercy from law. Now, law is important. The New Testament is the perfect law of liberty. We have law. We must understand that. But it's not from the law that you learn mercy. You learn that from grace. That's where you learn mercy. And in the home, we need grace. I need it. My wife needs it. You need it. You need grace. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Here's what Peter said. Above all, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. But now Christianity is not a, a pie-in-the-sky fairy tale. Christianity is all about grace. And the result of grace is mercy. So, learn to burn your grudges. Don't hold a grudge. You know, far too often we're like that dog who buries the bone. He always knows where that bone is. He can go dig it up again. We're too much like that. When we bury that bone, we need to forget where we buried it. When you forgive, you need to forget it. Learn to burn those grudges. Learn to be merciful. The story is told of a counseling session in which the, the husband said at a certain point in the counseling when the counselor was going through the issues and at a certain point, the husband said, now right there is where my heart, my wife rather, that right there is where my wife gets historical. And the counselor said, no, the word is hysterical. He said, no, I mean historical because at this point she starts bringing up everything I ever did. She reviews my whole history. So she gets historical. Well, she needs to learn grace. She needs to learn mercy because marriages can't live that way. Instead, forget when you forgive. Rick, remember this part of the description in love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 5 says, love keeps no accounts of evil. That's true love. You don't keep any record of wrongs done. No account of evil. Number six, we need to learn to say in our marriages, I love and trust you completely. 
This beatitude in verse 8 is this. Blessed are the pure in heart. The word for pure means clean, unalloyed, unmixed, single. Learn to be able to say, I trust you completely. Blessed are the pure in heart. You know, I'm faithful to my wife because I love her. So I'm faithful to her. But more than that, I'm faithful to my wife because she loves me. She trusts me. I'm gone from her a lot, a lot more than she would like for me to be gone. But that's okay because she trusts me. She knows I'll behave myself because she loves me. And I will behave myself because I know how much she loves me, how much she trusts me. You know, when, when I'm counseling married couples and when the wife says, he doesn't love me anymore, I think, uh-oh, Katie bar the door. She is saying, I can and I will do anything I'm big enough to do because he doesn't love me anymore. You see, it's his love for her that kept her so closely tied to him and kept her faithful to him. And when she started thinking that that's gone, that he doesn't love her anymore, she thinks, well, she's not going to hurt him and she can do whatever she pleases. Remember that. It's how much your wife, your husband loves you. That will keep you honest. Pure in heart means I love and trust you completely. And there are so many people who don't have that kind of trust and they're in trouble. We need to be able to learn to say that and mean it because we are pure, single, unmixed in our heart. Learn to say, I trust you, I believe you, I love you unconditionally. And now number seven, we come down to the final thing in the Sermon on the Mount, in the blessed attitudes that we need to learn to say in our marriages. I will make allowance for your bad days. For the Lord said, blessed are the peacemakers. You know, men often say, well, women like to talk. Well, let me tell you something. Men do too. Men do too. But just men don't use as many words as women do. Women, men like to talk as much as women do, but women just use a lot more words. I, I'm, there's a study on that. Have you seen that? That's true. But what amazes me more about women than anything is they all talk at the same time. How do, you under, how do they understand each other when they're all talking at the same time? But that, men like to talk too. We have a thing up in, in January and February because usually the weather's bad. <laughs> and... Um, not this year, not right now, but usually the weather's real too, it's too cold to go fishing and play golf. So every Thursday, we, one of our deacons who's retired has this big basement and he, ha, he invites all of the men who can come every Thursday at 10 o'clock, from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock and we have lunch together and we talk and we play games and we just fellowship. We have about 16 or 18 of us every Thursday. Just January and February, because March you can play golf, see, and you can fish and do stuff like that. And we like to talk. So it's not just the women, we like to talk. But what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You know, we were saying earlier, it's our job to make our spouse look good. Therefore, we will never say anything publicly to disparage our spouse, be a husband or wife. We're never going to say anything negative. Never say anything to make them look bad. We're going to build them up and make them look good. And that's a peacemaker. That's a peacemaker. You know, husbands, do you know how to make your wives mad? Oh, you're thinking right now, oh, I know what button to push. I know that button, and when I push that button, oh, look out, boy, she's going to hit the roof. Well, do you ever push that button? You're a war maker. You're a war maker. So I ask you another question. Do you know how to make your wife happy? 
Do you know how to make her feel good? Do you know that button to push? Then you're a peacemaker. So which button are you pushing? Are you a war maker or are you a peacemaker? The Lord said, blessed are the peacemakers. But we all have our bad days. Whether that button's pushed or not, we fly off the handle, you know, and the wheels come off the bus and boy, look out. I mean, it's just a, we need to go away to ourselves for a while. You know, even in the best marriages, there are times when husband and wife need to, some quiet time to kind of be alone and meditate and think about things. We need to allow that. We need to allow that time. Blessed are the peacemakers. I'm going to make allowances for your bad days. Sometimes you get something happens. I don't know. You just don't feel good when you get up in the morning. You got a backache or something or you got a headache and something hits you the wrong way. And boy, you just whew, say something you shouldn't say. The other one, going to let that slide. Going to be a peacemaker. I'm going to let that go. I'm going to make allowances for your bad days. Then there was sometimes like, you know, it's in, in my marriage, in my family, you know, my home. It's just Mary Jane and I now. It's been that way for, what, 15 years? <laughs> a long time. It's just been back to the two of us again. We're back where we started. And, you know, I'll say something that hits her wrong. And then she starts interrupting my sentences. And, and, and every sentence that she says starts with the word you. About half a dozen sentences in a row all start with the word you. The personal pronoun. <laughs> I'm going to let that go. I'm going to make allowances for a bad day because I'm a peacemaker. The Lord said, blessed are the peacemakers. So we don't get together and berate the husband. We don't get together and berate the wife. And we do that, we're in bad shape because we're war makers. We all have bad days. Everybody has bad days. We have to make allowances for them. So there's just one conclusion to this lesson. Just one conclusion to these beatitudes, these seven great attitudes to have in our marriages, these seven things that we must learn to be able to say in our marriages. And the one conclusion is marriage is still the greatest thing on earth. You know, people sometimes say it's a little bit of heaven, a good marriage is, and there's... Some, I understand that. There's some meaning there. I, I understand the truth of that. There's nothing sweeter, nothing more wonderful than a good home. You know, I look forward to going home tonight. I look forward to being at home tonight before I leave in the morning and go to Freed Hardman for the lectureship for a few days. I look forward to being at home tonight. There's just nothing sweeter than that. So today, when our afternoon service is over, Go home together. Enjoy that. Kids, hug mom and daddy a little tighter. And I hope mom and dad, after this series of lessons, is a little happier with each other and has a little better marriage. If you have a good home, if you have a good marriage, a good home, a good family, you are one of the richest people on earth. I don't care what you have by way of material things. If your home is sound and solid and your marriage is good, you're one of the richest people on earth. And there's not anything wrong with enjoying that. Just enjoy it. Thank you so much.